Thank you. Um, I'm Victor Jasinich, Jasinich, and I'm here to talk about the decentralized era, how to distribute or how to decentralize. And first, I want to talk about myself a little. I want to give you a little background. I'm going to give you a little introduction about what means centralized or what means a platform to be centralized. And I'm going to identify two kinds of decentralization. One is the one we know, the big data approach, um, which is decentralized systems. And one is the Bitcoin approach, the peer-to-peer -peer approach, uh, which is peer-to-peer -peer systems. I will give some examples. And I'm going to list some pros and cons about each of uh, these kinds of decentralization. And I'm going to throw some conclusions to think about. If you have some questions, you can approach to me later. So um, I'm Victor Jasinitz. Uh, here's the IPA of how to pronounce my, my surname. I'm uh, a DevOps engineer at Stratio Big Data. Uh, I have a master's degree at the Complutense University of Madrid. And I spent three years working as a developer in small companies. And then I spent two years working as a researcher at the university, where I began to develop some decentralized applications using blockchain and Ethereum. And uh, that, at, that, at that point was emerging. So I'm kind of uh, the first uh, one, uh, the group of the first ones who actually tested the platform. And then right now I'm working as a DevOps engineer at Stratio Big Data. So I'm going to give you a little introduction now about centralized systems. What means centralized? What is, uh, what's the meaning of decentralization? So, at the beginning of internet era, the technology was expensive and few people can, could access to the internet. So, the amount of users the internet platforms received at that age uh, was very few. So, at the, uh, in the 200s, as the technology, technology grew cheaper, many, many services began to be in the internet and the accessibility to the internet was, um, was uh, very wide. So everyone can begin to, uh, everything, everyone can begin to uh, be in the internet. So how these platforms can handle thousands of millions of connections every day. I'm going to give you four examples. Um, at the beginning of the, these enterprises, they were centralized in a single server. Take, for example, Facebook, which uh, began in the, a university server, Netflix, Amazon, and Google. These four services right now are heavily decentralized with hundreds of data servers around the world. Um, with, um, take, for instance, Amazon, which is the pioneer of uh, infrastructure of a service. Google, uh, which is the father of big data. And Netflix which, and Facebook, which offer this, their services around the world with uh, hundreds of data replication, images, videos. So why decentralized? Why do we need to decentralize a uh, service or a platform? Um, if you have something centralized, it means you have one focal point of attack. What if your servers? are in Texas, for instance, and you have a natural disaster. What happens to your data? You lose your data. What happens if you get a DDoS attack and you have only one server? Um, the, decentral the, decentral sorry, the decentralization is necessary today because the amount of connections are uh, colossal. So, um, in order to decentralize, we have to choose one of these, these two options. We have uh, 
the, the proper centralized architecture, you can, we can choose between the centralized architecture or distributed architecture. If you, if you sorry, um, the big data approach, the technology we use today in all of the services on the bus uh, outside uh, are heavily decentralized. Instead of having one server, we have several servers uh, which are interconnected to each other. And uh, if I lose our decentralized server, uh, I could um, have another to back it up. But in a distributed architecture, uh, the server is provided by the, by the network and the users. So um, uh, the first approach is a decentralized system. It's a highly hierarchical network where each node has a role, and the role contributes to the system. But the power remains centralized. I will be talking about power, and I mean the capability to turn down a system. If I want to, if I have my cluster in Mesos, or I have my cluster in Amazon, I have the capability to turn it down because I own my service. But in peer-to-peer -peer systems, it's a non-hierarchical network, and all the nodes have the same role. The problem is that the, that the power is distributed. If I want to uh, turn off the blockchain, the Bitcoin's blockchain, I couldn't because every node contributes to the network. I'm going to focus on these two. Um, first, I want to talk about decentralized systems. Okay, so how to decentralize the system? If you have a centralized server, you have to split the functionality in nodes. These nodes are um, usually machines that are connected one to each other. So if you want, for instance, more computational power, you just add a node. If you think it's too expensive for you, you just remove a node. So um, the kind of flexibility this decentralization offers is very big. So take, for instance, Apache Mesos, uh, which you see here, it's uh, from its web page. And you have here a number of nodes. You have a Mesos master, which is uh, one node uh, which are chosen with a quorum, and the other masters. And then you have agents. This means that, uh, as I said earlier, you have a highly hierarchical network because the master is the one who controls the nodes. And the master are chosen between other masters. Uh, each node has a role. That's why um, uh, we, can, we cannot change um, the behavior of a node unless we add one or we remove one. And the power remains centralized. I can use Mesos to deploy my microservices. And if I, if I don't want to deploy anything, I just turn it down, and it's OK. Another example is Spark. I'm sure you all know Spark. I have a, uh, Spark jobs, which I feed the system with. And I have a master node, which control what, uh, um, what node is going to uh, do the working. So um, via my cluster manager, each Spark node is assigned to a worker node. It work in, each worker node has, has an executor and a series of tasks. If I want more computational power, I just add a worker node. I can add uh, several worker nodes if I have to. Um, if I have to have a level of big data process. But if it's too expensive for me, I just remove some worker nodes or just throw the system away. Stratio offers also a decentralized platform to control and govern the, a company's data. And it has several layers, which you can see here. If you want to test our platform, and if, if you want to know more about Stratio's data centric, you can go to our booth, 
we have a demo here, uh, there, and we can explain to you one uh, how this works. So I'm going to list some pros and cons about this kind of decentralization. The first one, it's obvious, is the data replication. You can have a lot of data centers or databases distributed in several places. You, we can have, I can have my data here in Madrid and another data center in um, London, another in China. So my, if I lose one of my nodes, I'm safe because my data is replicated. I can have a lot of scalability, as, as I said earlier. If I want more computational power, I just add a node. If I don't need that computational power, I just move the node. <coughs> this technology supports multi-region. If I want to have a worldwide platform, I just need to have some data centers around the world, like many companies do, like Google, for instance. Um, I can have one data center here and uh, one in the United States, and they interconnect each other to share databases, users, connections. And uh, th this platform has a heavy node loss resistance because if I uh, suffer an attack and I lose one of my nodes, I'm safe because I can uh, um, just add another node and replicate the data. What's the problem here? I, I said the problem remains centralized is a problem because I need to I want to have a like more Bitcoin approach and it's a con for me because um, if you if a company has the power the users needs needs to um, trust this company so uh, if I need to trust in Facebook to give Facebook my data. Uh, maybe Facebook is selling my data to others. So for me, it's kind of a problem. That's why the power remains centralized. Usually, this decentralization is expensive because if you have, if you want to have a big, big um, cluster of nodes, it's going to cost you a lot. It requires a lot of man maintenance because you have to have ex specialized uh, people to upgrade, to look for vulnerabilities. And um, that's one of the biggest problems in today's uh, data centers, because the technology is evolving very fast, and you need to um, patch every vulnerability. And if you have a large number of nodes, it's, it's very complicated. So the other distributed System, the other decentralization system I want to talk about, I, I need to focus on this because uh, nobody seems to care about this kind of decentralization, is the peer-to-peer -peer system. I want to I wanna clarify the fog of, around this system because everyone want to, be, want to make blockchain and, and uh, they, they lie to you about the blockchain thing. They, they are lying about how blockchain works. So here we have a fully distributed network, OK? You have a peer-to-peer -peer network, which uh, are nodes interconnected to each other in a non-hierarchical network, as I said earlier. And every node has the same role. That means that I have the same power that the uh, node that that every other node, when I connect to the network, and I can contribute to the network the moment I get into it. So um, I want to talk about Bitcoin's blockchain, which is the pioneer of this kind of decentralization. And blockchain, it's actually a distributed database um, to control transaction between users. This database is replicated in each node, and it's based on blocks, as you see here, that are, are tied cryptographically with the nodes uh, beside him. So if I want to hack the blockchain, it's very difficult because if I have to, if I want to here change uh, transaction in block 55, I have to change 
the next blow, the next blocks, because they are tied cryptographically. So this system makes blockchain practically uh, unhackable. And if you want to talk about uh, how to hack blockchain, you can ask me later, because it's, it's, it's very interesting and it's very difficult. If you have a large, a large number of nodes, it's very difficult to uh, edit a blockchain. So Bitcoin, Bitcoin's blockchain, it's only about uh, money transactions between users. So one day came one guy named Vitalik Buterin and um, created Ethereum. Ethereum, it's a, a blockchain like Bitcoins, but for smart contracts. What, what are smart contracts? Smart contracts are small pieces of code small pieces of code that are executed and stored inside the blockchain. So every time one user executes, executes a smart contract, it's distributed inside the blockchain. So here you, we have a blockchain state, which uh, is the um, um, Ethereum blockchain. And I can upload and I can create transactions to create contracts inside the blockchain. Um, uh, I, I made here a sample contract, which is very simple. But uh, we can upload any kind of contract you want. And it's very, very secure because once a piece of code, a smart contract, is in the blockchain, you cannot change it. And that's, that's a very powerful thing, because you need to make sure that everything you upload to the blockchain, it's secure. So, what are the potential applications of this technology? Because uh, everyone seems to sell you blockchain, and uh, no one really does anything. So uh, here I listed four of the more important potential applications, which is the banking sector, um, to make tra transactions between, between banks. We have voting platforms. The government of Russia, I think, wanted to create a blockchain to um, be able to vote uh, in the internet. We have reputation systems. Sorry. We have reputation systems, um, uh, which are platforms that give you the possibility to vote interactions between users, and these interactions are, are decentralized. And decentralized companies. That's a thing I didn't believe about, but the other day I was talking about this with one of my colleagues, and he has a company which uh, is called ICO Funding. And th this company um, makes blockchain solutions for uh, other companies. So if you want to go to the stock market, you can um, have some shares, or you can create a smart contract in the blockchain and sell tokens, crypto tokens of your company uh, to be able to decentralize your company with the Ethereum uh, blockchain. If you want to talk about uh, how to achieve this, you can approach me later, and I will be very happy to talk to you. So here are other examples of a decentralized system. Um, IPFS, BitTorrent, and Emule. Those three are file systems that are decentralized in peer-to-peer -peer networks. I'm sure we all know email or BitTorrent. If you want to, if we want to download a movie, we we, <laughs> we can access to BitTorrent. But IPFS is a decentralized file system, just like BitTorrent, but um, it behaves differently because every file has a cryptographic hash that identifies him, and you can download it from. Uh, every node, 
and it's um, replicated it every time one user downloads a server um, file. Sorry. So if I have a file and I share the file with you, when you download the file, it's it's replicated. This is used. This was used uh, when Catalonia wanted to vote for independence, and the government of Spain uh, turned down their server. So the Catalonian uh, put all the server or the and the voting system in IPFS. So the government of Spain um, uh, shut down the IPF IPFS gateway, which you can access today. But uh, it's uh, a very powerful thing when a government wants to shoot your web, you can uh, you can use these technologies because they cannot fight this kind of decentralization. Um, um, sorry. So, if I want to create a fully distributed platform with no servers with no data centers, I could use these two technologies, Ethereum and IPFS. So every user connection has two uh, different things. One is the connection to the blockchain, which is made uh, uh, with a web server extension. And one is uh, the connection to the database, which is a IPFS gateway. So with this system, my colleagues and I uh, uh, were developing the decentralized uh, science project, which was funded uh, three months ago uh, with a the Ledger uh, grant. And we received, I think, $5,000 to develop this platform. This platform is uh, about decentralized the decentralization of the science. If you want to publish a scientific paper, you need to go to a publisher that is going to charge you for a lot of money. And uh, we wanted to change that, creating a fully distributed platform using these two technologies. One is the Ethereum blockchain, which, uh, in which each intera interaction is a transaction and you can audit it. And uh, each file is uploaded to an EPF, IPFS network, so no one, no one can um, turn it, uh, shut it down. There are some pros and cons about this technology. Uh, the first pro is obvious. It's very hard to hack because you need to hack a lot of nodes in order to change the blockchain. Here I, say, here I say borderless platform. I mean in two different ways. Borderless, as it is not in, the st in, in a single place. It's not in a single server. It's in every user that uses this kind of technologies. And it has no uh, laws, no governments that can um, uh, turn it down because it's in every country. So that's why I used a key here uh, borderless platform. As I said before, the power is distributed and I have a very powerful node loss resistance because the database is replicated in all the nodes. So if I lose one node, it's no problem because um, for the network, it's uh, it's pr practically nothing. One important code is the 51 attack. I said here the 51 attack is um, if we have if we every ha everyone here have the same database, how do we change it? How can I change the database? Um, if I can afford to hack. The 51 of the blockchain network, I can change. I can change it uh, because of the quorum uh, mechanism. So um, I think one year ago, the Ripple cryptocurrency was hacked 
with a 51 attack because no one uses rival and it, it was very ha very um, easy to hack. Uh, I also said here that it's very junk technology. No one here, I hope, uses blockchain or uses Ethereum. Maybe some of you have some Bitcoins because uh, three months uh, ago was very high, but no one uses blockchain nowadays because the people doesn't trust the, the technology. That's why it's very junk. <laughs> it needs a critical mass of users. You cannot have a private blockchain because the power of the blockchain is the third party um, trust because uh, every node contributes to the every node contributes to the platform if you have a platform with four nodes no one's going to use your blockchain so you need a critical mass of users to be able to develop deploy and use real applications and the other, the final one is the usability gap when I was developing the project I mentioned earlier, the decentralized science, we had a very big problem because this technology is very new. And in order to use it, you have to have uh, this um, Ethereum blockchain. You have to have a node in IPFS. And in order to have these things, um, you need to go to a process and it was very, very difficult. So there's a usability gap right now. I think in the future, it will be easier to use this kind of technology. But right now, it's very difficult. In, in fact, uh, my PhD director wanted to gift the team with a token called CryptoKitties. And one of us cannot receive that because the process of creating an account in Ethereum technology is very difficult. So if you don't have a technical background, you, don't, you will be not be able to use this technology. So that I think that's the, bigger, the biggest con right now. And uh, uh, I think it's the, the, the deal breaker here. So uh, I don't want to bore you anymore. I'm going to throw some conclusions. If you need to decentralize your servers, um, you, need, you uh, need to choose one of these two decentralization. One is platform, uh, the one platform is business oriented and it has long term benefits because you can throw millions to a, a Spark cluster and doesn't receive an, uh, any benefits in two years. If you want to analyze your business data, you need to plan uh, this kind of decentralization. That's why the benefits are long term. And this kind of decentralization is business oriented. The other part, the peer to peer architecture, uh, it builds a trustful network. That's why it's used, for instance, for voting systems. It has no border governments or laws. That's why it's used mostly for illegal things, sadly. And um, the, 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 the last one is the, the one I said earlier like three times is the power distribution. I think it's the most powerful thing to be able to have this kind of decentralization. And uh, I think it's, that's it. If you have some questions, you can, you can ask them now or you can approach me. So thank you very much. <laughs>